The Sydney Wooden Boat School Summer School class of 99 built two clinker dinghies, a snub or pram dinghy and a stem dinghy. In the last episode, we steam bent the ribs into the snub dinghy. The stem dinghy hadn't progressed much past the first few planks. Its purpose was to show how to shape a stem, how to fit planks to the stem, steam bending planks and the features of building right way up. Our snub dinghy is planked up with ribs fitted and mostly fastened off. Now we need to start fitting her out with stringers, risers, thwarts or seats, rub rails, knees and rollock blocks. Stringers are longitudinal members that stiffen up the hull. Risers or risings are stringers that are located so as to support the thwarts or seats at a suitable height. In this boat, the stringers and risers each follow the upper edge of a plank, so we left those nails out when fastening the ribs, but the holes have been drilled. In most small boats, the stringers and risers are of small enough dimension to bend in cold. To know where to locate it, use an offcut to mark either side of the nail hole so that the hole will be in the middle. Prepare the stock. Our stringers in the bilge will simply have their corners rounded over, but our seat risers will have a traditional decorative edge. This is most easily done with a slotted screw in a small block of wood carefully sliding along the riser edge with the slot cutting a small V. Round over the edge to a small radius. Stop or fade out just short of the ends. The risers in a boat like this generally only go just past the first and last ribs. Bend the riser in and hold the middle tight on the middle rib, locating it exactly on your pencil marks. Drill through the hole from outside with the correct drill size for the nail you'll be using, which you'll remember if you saw my earlier videos, it is larger than the square side of the nail, but smaller than the measurement across the diagonal of the nail. The drill should come through somewhere near the middle of the riser. Drive the nail through, backing it up on the inside with a dolly. Generally, the nail will be enough to hold it, but if it tries to move, row it over now. Carefully locating the riser on your marks, drill and drive nails progressively forward and aft. Don't miss a rib, or it will be hard to force it down to the rib when you get back to it. Rove them over when all are in. The bottom stringers can be done next. You'll need a helper or longer arms to fit this one. You need to prepare the stock for the thwarts or seats. Measure the distances and trim the boards over length. The edges should be straight and square. Don't do anything else to the edges at this point. Sometime around about now, you can trim the top of the transoms to the designed curve and plane down to the line at an angle that follows the shear line when viewed from the side. It's very satisfying how much this improves the look of your boat. Make sure the boat is sitting at the correct beam if you don't have a spreader notched across as when we started bending in the ribs. Fit the central thwart first. Carefully mark its location fore and aft. You may choose to chisel a narrow flat on the top corner of the riser, but this isn't really necessary. There are several ways you can fit the thwarts. As in many aspects of boat building, the most accurate and safest method is to make a template. But I found it quicker in these boats to mark the actual board roughly at each end so it's close but definitely oversize and worry it down. Some builders will fit the thwarts right up against the planking and notch them around any ribs in the way, but this is a bit of a trap for dirt and moisture which can lead to rot. We fit them against the ribs. Measure the maximum width of the thwart by clamping two sticks together, resting on the risers but packed up so that you are actually measuring the distance at the height of the upper surface of the thwart. While you've got the sticks there, measure the angle at which the thwart meets the rib with a bevel gauge. That will give us the angle at which to cut that that should sit on there fairly accurately. Place one end of the thwart stock on its marks with the other end over the gunnel but as close to being directly above its marks as you can determine. 
Use a block of wood or a set of compasses to scribe the shape of the hull onto the stock and mark the position of the rib where you use the measuring sticks. Place the sticks on the board and mark the distance from starboard rib to port rib on the board in the correct spot. Put the board back in the boat so the unscribed side is resting on the riser with the scribed side now resting on the gunnel directly above its marks. Scribe the side of the hull, but start just outside your width mark so we have a safety margin. Cut to both these lines with a jigsaw or bandsaw set to the angle that you measured with the bevel gauge on the measuring sticks. The thwart should still be oversized, but it may just fit below the gunnel. Repeat the scribing procedure on both sides because the angle may subtly change as you get closer. Always staying just outside your measured width until you get really close. If the thwart sits on two ribs, it is important for it to bear firmly on both on each side as well as sitting firmly on the riser. When you're happy with the fit, you can finish the fore and aft edges of the thwart. Some builders scallop the underside to thin down the edges, but in these boats we're quite happy with simply rounding over the edges on the underside, but stopping short of the landing area. The top edges are finished with the same bead edge moulding that we used on the riser. Apply a sealing coat or two of primer if painting or varnish if finishing clear to the thwart ends and the riser and parts of the rib it lands on before fastening off. The thwarts are simply screwed down to the riser, making sure you are drilling into the riser. You can countersink the screw heads or counterbore and plug. They do come from the same. There are lots of different names for what I'll call the rails. Rub rails, out whales, gunnel or gunnel strips, or even sponsons on larger craft. On these and many other boats, they can be bent around coal, but on some boats, they will require steaming. We simply clamp them in position, sighting up to ensure that our shear line will look sweet and fasten them off with screws into the transoms at each end and nails through every rib head. Most traditional Australian dinghies had no in-whale, but if you want one, it's generally fitted along with the rail, sometimes after the quarter knees have been fitted, but not often. We usually fit the rails before the knees because in light dinghies like these, sometimes fitting the rail will change the angle where the plank meets the transom by just enough to make a knee not fit properly. I usually round over the underside of the rails but not the upper side at this stage because the sharp corner helps in sighting up the curve of the shear which is very important to get right. The pram dinghy needs four quarter knees. A stem dinghy requires two with a single breast hook in the bow. These are all traditionally cut from crooks with curved grain. In our case, tea tree, a Melaleuca species. They can also be laminated and on small boats, you can get away with cutting them from straight grain stock as long as you orient the grain across the area to be spanned. Sometimes it's best to make plywood or even thick cardboard templates to use in selecting stock. Cut your stock well oversized so that you have a big allowance for fitting. The secret to fitting knees is to finish one side first. If one side is straight, fit this side first. Start by placing a sliding bevel gauge into the corner where the knee will live, then roughly cut your knee stock to this angle, or cut from your template if you have one. Hold the roughly cut knee in position and use the bevel gauge to pick up the angle for the side that will be against the transom. Plane the bevel on the knee in a vise, making sure the landing area is straight. Then offer up the knee in place and hold it firmly against the transom. If it sits firmly without rocking and the other leg sits parallel to the shear, then you've got the bevel angle right and this side of the knee is finished. If it rocks or cants up or down, you need to correct it. Once you're happy with the fit, hold it in place and scribe the other side and pick up the bevel angle with a bevel gauge. 
Be aware that on some boats, the bevel will change along the length of the knee. You may also need to mark for a notch for a rib. From then on, it's a matter of planing to your pencil marks, offering it up for another trial fit, correcting any errors until the fit is light, tight and solid. Repeat with the matching knee on the other side, and only when both are fitting well should you mark and cut the other side to shape. Cut one and use it as a template for the other side. A drum sander or the drum on a belt sander is best for cleaning up the blade marks on the inside of the curve. You need a good eye to shape an attractive knee. They always look better when one side is longer than the other and there are set rules to this. Stern quarter knees should always be longer on the transom than on the planking. Bow quarter knees, if you have a bow transom, should be longer on the planking. Thwart knees should be longer on the thwart than up the hull side. The ends should taper off. Knees that end in a chunky round curve are an abomination. And of course, knees on both sides of the boat must match. I usually drill the holes first and then seal the mating surfaces and only bed them down and fasten them off after this dries. Line up your long series drill bit very carefully because both the nail head and the rove end are usually visible. Clamp the knee in place and pencil in the positions of the fastenings, ruling a line across the knee for the drill to follow. Drill the holes through the knee first on the bench, then clamp it back in place and continue the holes right through. When you're ready to fasten off, drive the nails from the outside until the points just protrude at the mating surface. Then locate the knee over the points and drive them through, backing it up with a dolly. Each thwart needs a knee on each side to stiffen up the side of the boat. The rule about tapering the ends doesn't apply to the top of a thwart knee because it has to be substantial enough to take a fastening close to the top. So they're usually finished with the rove landing area parallel to the hull side and the top close to horizontal, then rounded off slightly. As in the general rule about one side being longer than the other, the thwart leg is always longer. All the thwart knees should look in proportion, so you should choose a percentage by which each lower leg is longer than the upper leg. I usually choose 15 to 20 percent. Simply measure the height from the thwart to the shear line and add 15 percent or whatever to the length of the lower leg. Larger boats will often have two knees per side, and these are always set close to the edge of the thwart and parallel to each other. In our case, the centre thwart knee is fitted exactly on the centre line of the thwart. The forward and aft thwart knees look better if they're close to a right angle at the hull side and therefore cross the thwart at an angle. This looks best if the middle of the lower leg crosses the centre line of the thwart. Lightly pencil in a thwart ship's centre line near where you expect the knee to live, then square out from the hull side so that your square line crosses the centre line at exactly half the length of the lower leg. This way, each end of the knee is the same distance from the nearest edge of the thwart. The centre of the knee is in the centre of the thwart. Using the rule of getting one side of the knee dead right first, plane the lower leg dead straight and square in a vice and offer it up to the thwart. Place it on marks both sides of the line you squared out from the hull so that the squared line is the centre line of the lower leg. Scribe the hull shape on the upper leg on both sides. On this boat the knee will sit on two planks and you can notch the landing over the plank if you are keen but it is much simpler and just as strong to plane two flats and leave a small triangular gap near the plank lap. You will probably need several goes at this because of the different angles at the landing. But this will be a structural joint as well as a visible one, so it's worth spending the time to get it right. Always work to pencil marks. Scribe it with a pencil. Don't just guess a little bit here and a little bit there.
Rollocks were typically fitted in hardwood blocks fastened to the inside of the gunnel in Australian dinghies. These traditionally were simply rounded or finished with three flats, which is what we chose. The backs have to be fitted very carefully so that they bear solidly on the planking. And they're fastened with eight nails, the upper four going through the rails. Around about now, there's a bit of trimming, sanding and general tidying up to do. that the class made a few knees but didn't have time to fasten them in before a brief launching ceremony on the last day. We gave the hull a coat of oil to reduce the timber's ability to soak up water for the brief outing and launched it into Roselle Bay just outside the shed complex we were in. We were families in attendance for the traditional sausage sizzle and beer. Gentle rowing for the rest of the It works. And at the end of two weeks, Trisha <laughs> whipped up the so sausage sandwich. Would you like snag. a sausage sandwich? Here we are. You've got to help yourself to yeah. sauce. Oh, all right. oh, oh gee, now, do you want two slices or one? No, one will do that. One will do. This was the last summer school class I ever did, and I decided to keep the boat. It took me years to get around to finishing off the boat. I fitted the knees and floorboards in 2014. Floorboards, or more correctly sole boards or bottom boards, help protect the hull planking from feet, but are cleated together, held down with turn buttons and removable for cleaning. I added a stuffed fire hose fender around the rail and began to use it as a tender to my Lyle Hess 24 footer and my Halverson 25. It's a great little tender and the plans are available on the Sydney Wooden Boat School website. The design is called Peewee, and there's also a slightly larger pram dinghy called Petrel. The stem dinghy is called Pippi. Thanks for watching and happy boat building. Oh, yes. Oh, the last one. And so endeth the lesson.